<laughs> like any embarrassing moments you can share that you you know wouldn't Amazing, be too bad for the internet. Not today. <laughs> Had to be in private. Okay, so since Mason, since you play ball, um, you know I'm a great athlete, and I shared this in the Apes video. So you people out there in internet land, y'all don't need to watch this twice, unless you just really like AP Bio. Um, we. So I was on B team and we were playing. I don't. I can't remember who it was. And we were at home. And do y'all do warm ups, full warm ups, top and bottom, or just tops? What do you mean? Like, do you wear like top and bottom warm ups that you take off? Oh, just the top. Like, just yeah, yeah. Sure. But we had the old school ones where like they had the big bottoms and they like you could Very pop them off or whatever. And we had the big tops, like full length. I mean, you'd be sweating by the time you got out of there. And um. We were on B team. I think they were all hand-me-downs from varsity days of old, and they were too big. But anyway, um, so warm-ups was over. We go over. We're getting ready for the game. Coach is talking, and I'm on the end. The cheerleaders from the opposing team are behind us. There's probably three people in the stands that are actually from the, whatever town it was. And then there were probably, I don't know, maybe 100 people in the stands on the other side. And um, I go to pull off the warm-ups. So I pull off the top. And I go pull the bottoms, and all of a sudden I hear like this like roar of laughter, and I look down and like I can see my underwear, because the <laughs> warm ups have this like super thick elastic. I don't know if you've ever seen like the old school ones. I've seen them. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like the elastic. I, I remember it. It's ridiculously thick, and so when you grab them, you, got, you grab a lot of elastic. And I just like I guess I was in a hurry, pull them down all the way to my knees, and. Um, Needless to say, the girls from the opposing or cheerleaders got an eyeful. And, I, like, nobody – the thing is, nobody on the team saw it because I was in the very end. And, like, everybody else had already kind of got over in the huddle. So I'm, like, pulling my pants back up, trying to get my warm-ups off. And I don't even know if anyone saw it on our side because nobody ever said anything to me. It was just the cackle of laughter that a couple times that I got took out of the game um, reminded me. But uh, I tried to stay in the game as much as possible that night. But anyway, things happened. They may have thought I did it on purpose. It was definitely not on purpose. I bet your bottom dollar I was super careful taking off warm-ups from then on, though. <laughs> okay, let's talk about viruses. Um, on page 394, um, I just want to say hey to all my fans out there and all my students. I know that my channel said this channel is for my students, but if you're out there learning AP Bio from this, then technically you are one of my students. And I hope you learn something and um, become a better person. Let's all do something nice for somebody today. Yeah. I got an orange popsicle stick. You know what I'm going to do with this? You might remember. Orange popsicle stick means? Become. No. <laughs> Did y'all do these? Is that a tip? No, no, no. Was it the tip? I don't know. I can't remember. Gosh, I just told I should have wrote it down. <laughs> Hold on a second. Y'all didn't get these? I can't believe y'all didn't get these. Orange, 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 orange. Hold the door open for someone. I do that all the time. This morning I saw a special ed lady from downstairs coming in. I was like, I'm going to get the door for her because her hands are full. Yeah. And I did that. And I felt better about myself. You know, when you do something nice, you not only make yourself feel good, you make other people feel good. And that's what we call win-win. All right, you guys out there, do something nice for somebody. Um, virus. We talked about viruses yesterday. We talked about the vaccine and how it worked. Um, at least a couple of vaccines that we've got out. We talked about uh, maybe a new one on the horizon from Johnson & Johnson. We talked about what viruses are made of. We kind of discussed a little speculation. Viruses are alive. Are they dead? Are they somewhere in between? That's probably where I would go with that. Um, they're not, well, we'll get to that in a second. First of all, what are viruses made of again? DNA or RNA. Okay, so they've got DNA or RNA on the inside, like the inside of a gusher. Is it gusher? Gusher. Gusher, gusher whatever. And you don't see those much anymore. Anyway, and then on the outside, what do they have? Protein coat. Okay, so they got a protein coat called a capsid. Good. And the protein coat is significant because it acts like a Trojan horse. Um, the virus is like, hey, I'm just a normal protein trying to get inside so you can chop me up and use me for the amino acids to make things you need. And then, oh, no, I'm a deadly virus. I'm going to embed myself inside you and kill you. Yes. So, 
That's all the way down to part B in the notes on where it says HIV AIDS. Uh, really, HIV is the virus, AIDS is the syndrome. HIV, HIV virus has a viral envelope derived from the helper, T helper white blood cells. So the biggest problem with HIV is what? Why is it so bad? Y'all familiar with this? AIDS kills a lot of people in the world. I think it's, it's around a million people every year. Maybe it's a little bit below that now, but it's still pretty high. Most people dying from HIV are where? Sub-Saharan Africa, yeah. So it's pretty rampant. We'll, we'll get into this, those stories later when we um, have more time. But um, where was I going with that? Oh, so HIV infects your helper T cells. Your helper T cells do what? Yeah, so helper T cells, uh, for you that don't remember, they help to activate your specific immune response. So the fight against specific pathogens that invade your body. And so basically the, help, the HIV infects those, which pretty much renders your specific immune response useless. And so that's why most people with HIV um, or AIDS wind up, they wind up developing, they usually die from what? What? Like another disease. Pneumonia, some other disease, yeah. Like, I mean, they may get the flu, get pneumonia, and then die because their bodies aren't able to fight that off. So some secondary condition. So that's the problem that you have there um, with that affecting those helper T cells. I am hopeful and expect that some point, probably in your lifetime, if I don't die before then, um, that they will develop some type of vaccine or some better treatment for HIV AIDS. Um, although I would say this now, I mean, y'all can look at Magic Johnson. He's got had HIV since 1992. I remember when he came out and had to quit the Lakers. Um, and he's lived a pretty good, normal life. He's running the Dodgers and some other stuff, right, isn't he? Yeah. So um, he ran the Lakers for a couple years, didn't he? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you can live a pretty normal life now with the medicines that we have, the antiviral medicines. It's just, um, I mean, you've got half a million people probably in sub-Saharan Africa that are still dying. So if we're ever going to get to the point where we start saving some of these people, we're going to have to do something about that. Bacteriophages at the bottom of 394. Bacteriophages look a lot like a... It's the one over there. A what? Did you say a virus? Oh, it kind of looks like, it does look like a spider. I, I always think it looks like an alien spaceship. Um, like a weird alien or some, maybe an alien spider. There we go. We'll compromise. And like it lands on you and then it injects its DNA inside you and then takes over and kills you. So, um, but yeah, a spider's not too bad. So, um, bacteria and bacteriophage is, is not a bacteria. It's actually a, what is a bacteriophage? Okay. So bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. And so viruses and bacteria have a long history of fighting one another throughout the throughout time since they've been around, okay? And so viruses are constantly evolving new ways to attack and kill bacteria, and bacteria are evolving constant ways to um, fight off and um, get rid of viruses when they are infected. Viruses are not technically considered living organisms, although they are made up of organic material, um, they're not able to reproduce, live on their own. Now, I like the way the note writer does this. Uh, Walker, read that for us there, part D. Viruses are not living organisms. They cannot be killed. They can be denatured through chemicals, though. Some of these chemicals are in antiviral products you may use, like hand soaps or Kleenex. Y'all get that. So, yeah, it technically saying they can be, you probably see this on like Lysol and other stuff, like this says kill 99% of viruses or whatever, 99.9%. Um, I think we're just getting into uh, semantics here. You, you can't technically kill it because it's not technically alive, but you can denature it where it's not gonna function properly. So remember, since the outside is a protein coat, if you denature the protein, the protein's gonna what? It's gonna not function. It's gonna unfold, and so your structure's affected, which means your Functions affected. So that's really what's going on with things like um, Clorox and, hey, um, Fife, 
Tell us, look at that hand sanitizer over there. How much alcohol you got in that? Do not drink the hand sanitizer. I don't care how much alcohol is in there. I don't know on the side of the label. You're on the internet. Hurry up. People are, thousands of people are watching you. They're probably commenting right now. Reading's important. <laughs> it's on there. God bless America. Jordan had it this morning. Put it up. Hand it to Katie. It's got. It's like seventy or eighty percent. What does your say? Ninety nine percent alcohol. Does it say how much alcohol is in yours? Okay, so Taze says 62%, good. Um, 70%. 70%. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> you got to get your life together, bro. All right, you don't eat. How are you expected to know what's inside something when it says it and you can't even read it on there? So that's a lot of alcohol. The alcohol um, serves the purpose of denaturing or breaking apart those proteins, and so that's what's going on there, just like with uh, Clorox or bleach or anything like that. You're denaturing those proteins in the virus, so you're rendering it useless. And that's what you want to do when you clean surfaces. All right, um, it's the denaturing. means it's unnatural. Viral reproduction. So flip over to page 395. There's a picture of viral reproduction there. Basically what's happening is the virus is, in most cases, the bacteriophage is a little bit different since they're just injecting their DNA or, um, in there. Most viruses, they're getting in a host cell, they're using the host cells mechanisms to make a bunch of viruses, and then the viruses spill out, and then they infect other cells. So let's flip over to 396 real quick here. So in 396 and 397, you can see, um, according to Campbell here, we've got the lytic and lysogenic life cycles. So these are also in your notes. So lytic and lysogenic, you can see I'm taking good notes right here. All right, anytime you see that LY, they're talking about lysine, um, what does it mean to lice? Split. Okay, lice. It's not, you people on the internet, this is not the stuff in your hair. So, the ditches. Um, lysine, in this case, L-Y-S-I-S, -S, or L-Y-S-E, I guess if it's just lice open, um, means to split or break open. So, when viruses infect your cells, they're going to get in, they're going to cause them to split open, spill stuff out. Now, this happens in both cases. One case, it just, uh, if you're just looking at the two here on 396 and 397, what's the main difference that you notice here? Um, that one's lytic and this one's lysogenic. What's the main difference you notice between the two? The one on 396 is a lot faster. Okay, it's a lot faster. There's a lot less steps. Good, with a lytic infection. I right, read that one for us, Mariah. Um, where it says lytic infection. So this would be like with the flu virus. Notes. We're not reading through all that stuff in the book. You got it? The A? Yeah. This cycle destroys once the cell and the virus leaves from what sounds like violence. Okay. So, lytic life cycle is pretty simple and straightforward. So, let's say you're hanging around somebody and they've got the flu and or COVID or a bunch of other stuff. We'll go with flu since it's pretty common. And so a flu virus gets inside your body. We watched a video about this, right? There's a good discovery video online that, that illustrates this. But basically, you get a flu virus into one of your cells in like your throat. So that on the outside of that virus are these proteins. And they're like basically like saying to the cell, hey, here's a protein. And you can use this for I mean, using amino acids to make other proteins. And so the cell's like, oh, I'll take you in and use you. And then it gets in there. And then it's like, oh, I'm a virus and I'm going to kill you now. So it gets in there, it starts replicating those viral particles, the DNA and the um, proteins. Viruses get constructed, they get put together. Um, I think in the case of the flu virus, I wanna say it's roughly about 5,000 are made, and then the cell just like burst open and viruses go everywhere. That's a lot of viruses from one cell. So now imagine you've went from one virus that got in and infected one cell, and now you got 5,000 running around infecting all the other cells around it. So it doesn't take that long once that replication process starts to happen. Um, 
The other type of viral life cycle is called the lysogenic life cycle. And this is what we find with like the herpes. So y'all listen up here. Um, and there's, a, there's another STD we'll reference here. Um, it's quite common. So lysogenic, read that for us, Matthew. Lysogenic life cycle. In this type of cell, the virus permanently incorporates its DNA into the host genome, but does not immediately kill the host, a.k.a. temper. It sounds like temper. Okay, so as Walker said, th this there's a lot more steps. It looks like it takes longer. Keep going. The virus lives inside the host cell. As, long, as the host cell reproduces by mitosis, so does the virus. When the virus becomes aggravated, it pulls out the genome, reproduces, and leaves the cell by lysis, thereby killing the host in the process. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Let's say that you're a young child, and, I don't know, you ran into something, or you cracked your lip, you go to Christmas, grandma gives you a kiss, grandma's got a little bit of a cold sore, and in that cold sore is what? Herpes. Some herpes, good. So... There are different herpes viruses, so y'all can clarify. I'm not going to tell you what to Google here, but um, there are some that are more indicative you find in your uh, genitals and some on your mouth and then some even in your eyes. So you got to be careful. There's lots of herpes virus. I actually think that, um, what is that? Chicken pox is a type of herpes simplex virus. Anyway, so, no, no, I know it is because how, how it works. Anyway, so let's say the cold sore. So grandma gives you a kiss. You get a couple of those viruses in that crack in your lip. And um, basically what happens is inside that virus, there is RNA. And so that RNA is going to get inside there. And it's at the end. Let's go ahead and skip down to retroviruses. I'll go ahead and explain this. Um, that virus, that RNA in that virus is going to use an enzyme, reverse transcriptase. We talked about this a little bit earlier or a few days ago. It's going to copy from RNA backwards into DNA, and it's going to incorporate that DNA into your genome. Remember how I talked about like our genome, only about 2% of it actually codes for proteins. And like there's a lot of old viral DNA and there's a bunch of pseudo genes that no longer uh, code for stuff. So a lot of that viral DNA probably got in there at some point like this. And so that viral DNA gets inside your cells in your lip. So you may not have a cold sore or anything. It may come around that's next year, it's getting cold, and your lips kind of crack a little bit. You're not keeping moisturized good. And those cells, something in them like aggravates them. Now, um, during that aggravation process, I like to use Blistex, what about y'all? Burt's Bees, I like Burt's Bees. I like Blistex, too. Um, anyway, I'm not getting paid for that, so don't worry out there. Uh, where'd we get? So those that herpes genome that's embedded in your DNA, so that cell's getting aggravated, and it's like, oh, it's time to start making some copies. Something's going on here. Maybe, I don't know, it thinks it's, the cells are dying. So it starts making a bunch of copies. The cell starts replicating those viruses, and eventually the viruses do what? like hundreds or thousands of them. They go boom, the cell blows open and then other cells around it explode and then you have a what? A crap ton of viruses. What does it look like? The crap ton of viruses. It looks like a cold sore. So that cold sore is actually caused by those cells like splitting open and viruses going out. So um, hence why you don't want to make out with somebody with a cold sore. Yeah. Now, we do have some medicines for this now, and um, one of them that was originally developed for genital herpes is called Valtrex. They used to have these commercials all the time. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these. They had, like, two, like, young, hip, good-looking people, like, playing at the beach or walking through the woods or something, something ridiculous. Like, they look way too happy. And um, they're like, Valtrex, it's all about suppression. And so, basically, what they were talking about is this viral viral antiviral medication like at the onset of um starting to get one you can take this and basically it's a viral suppressor um, and there's a lot of viral suppressing medicines that are out there now i think valtrex may be one that you just continuously take because if it's the same applies to genital herpes if you get it you've got it for how long ever it's embedded into your dna and so the only thing you can really do at that point, the same thing with cold sore, is what? 
take me try to suppress the viral outbreak. Yeah, and so if you can do that, then really it's almost like it's not there. Um, and so something to think about. Anyway, prophase, proviruses. Let's not worry about that. Number two, read that one for us, Sarah. Read it loud. You're on the internet. Okay, what's HPV? You guys should be very familiar with HPV. You might know what it is. You're so close. Human, human papilloma virus. Um, the CDC did a study, I don't know, five or ten years ago that came out. There's a thousand people they checked, teenagers. I think they were teenage girls because it's more catchy, shows up. Anyway. Um, roughly a thousand, and they were anywhere from I think 14 to 19 years old. I want to say 22 of them had some type of STD. 18 percent, so almost all of that 22 percent was HPV. HPV is a virus that um, ladies you'll get checked for quite often as you grow up. Um, there is a vaccine out for it called. It was one company make it, and they called it like the the blanks. If I remember, Gardasil. You ever heard of that? There was an HPV vaccine, and like you took it when you're like you could get it when you were I don't know thirteen or fourteen, and I think there was two or three doses that you take, and basically it's supposed to make you um, immune to HPV if you're exposed to it later on. And so guys, a lot of times like they can have HPV and it just never show any symptoms. The problem is. So in girls, a lot of times, this can show up um, and it embeds in what part of your body and cause what? I feel like we've talked about this. HPV can cause cancer, where? Cervical cancer. Cervical cancer. So when you go to the lady doctor, how do they check you for this? What do they give you? Or what's the test they use? Pap smear. So it's human papilloma virus. They do a pap smear. What are they testing for with the pap smear? They're basically taking like a big Q-tip or something and scraping the surface of your cervix. What are they looking for? Um, I think primarily looking for like cancerous or precancerous cells. So this is a virus that can actually alter your genome to where like it can cause cancer. Um, so, and I've known someone before that had this, someone that was fairly young actually. Uh, so you got to be careful there. That's one of those things that, that you have to go in and get checked for. Um, and for that reason, and so you wouldn't want to, I mean, if you had cervical cancer or precancerous cells, you would want to get that checked out and removed as quickly as possible because your cervix, if you lose it, what's going to happen? Yeah. I mean, like that's the pathway where like sperm goes up to fertilize the egg and that's the, the opening to where the baby comes out, the base of the uterus. So that's something that you, you know, and I, like I said, it's kind of a, a, an unfair shake there because, you know, guys, we don't have a cervix, so um, you might get some kind of warts or something else growing on you, but um, most of the time, it doesn't even show up a lot of times in guys. So it's really unfair. So that vaccine, hopefully that's helped some people out, um, but that's how that virus works, okay? Retroviruses, they're using that reverse transcriptase to embed into your DNA. So that's where that enzyme is important, where it comes into play. The common cold viruses also work that way. Um, it says common cold. There's a lot of different viruses with common cold. I'm not sure exactly which ones. Y'all know they said um, some of those cold viruses are actually, um, they also call them coronaviruses. Did y'all hear this? When, this came, when COVID came out? I think they said about 15% of what we would call the common cold um, viruses are corona type viruses. They have that similar shape. Um, they also speculated that, you know, maybe people that gotten a cold recently had a little bit more immunity. I don't know if that ever panned out or not though. All right, and the last part, gene therapy. Mason, read that for us. Genes that are coding for proteins or enzymes are inserted into viral cancers. The viruses are then injected into individuals Possessing genetic diseases associated with the missing or non functional protein or enzymes in an effort to treat the person suffer suffering from the condition. The DNA is hopefully taken up by the cell. So, in the case of gene therapy, what is the virus acting like? Like, very simply. Like a fake virus. Or fake one. What's its, what's its uh, purpose? To start it. 
Yeah, and really it's just kind of a, a mode of transportation to help get that immune response. So, and that's, um, that could be, what did it say, missing or non-functional enzymes and ever to cheat. So that could be, that's not necessarily like we talked about with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine yesterday. That could be just delivering some type of protein or enzyme that an individual may not have. Um, so it's almost just like a transport vessel there in that case, okay? Bacterial genomes. All right. We'll get some racy stuff here. Let's keep our composure. 398, we've got listed some different types of viruses. I'm not going to get into all those. They tell a little bit about how they're different and what diseases they cause. Um, at 399 on the top, that shows our just kind of a basic viral infection and how new viruses are made. Um, you guys, let's talk about the bacterial genome real quick. So, we're working our way down to these operons, which is going to be super confusing, but we need to we need to figure out and understand how bacteria work. So really quick, let me I'll draw this and make sure you, you know and understand this. Next Friday, Miss um, Clark from Science and Motion is going to come, and she's going to do a gel electrophoresis lab where we get like. You know, you have a little square gel and you put some DNA in one end and then it runs to the other end. You know what I'm talking about? Y'all ever seen that? Did y'all do that in ninth grade? Okay, well, we're going to do that. She's going to come and I don't know if she'll be here with this class, but she, we'll, we'll, we'll do gel electrophoresis in here. And so basically what you have is, well, hold on a second. You're going to have a little gel chamber. That's not a square. Anyway. Um, and then in one end, you've got a bunch of little holes or wells. You put your DNA in here and then the DNA runs this way. And this is how you tell who your baby's mom or daddy is. You know, like on the Mari show, all that. So basically you put your DNA in one end and then depending on how it separates out, like DNA bands will match up like with the child and with the mother and with the father. Obviously about half would match up with the mother and child and about half should be somewhere with the father and child. So that's what we're gonna do next week. The next week, we're gonna be doing a transformation lab. So in the transformation lab, what's transformation? Transformation. When bacteria change genetically for some reason. So you guys are gonna, what kind of DNA do bacteria have? So this is our bacterium. This has one thing chromosome. So it has one large circular chromosome. And then is that all the DNA it's got? That's like Little has little circles called plasmids. Good. So it has small little circular pieces of DNA called plasmids. Good. All right. Now, there's no nucleus, so this isn't membrane bound. Plasmids can be easily exchanged. So we talked about this a little bit earlier in the year. And so let's look at this real quick. We'll be done for the day. All right. Bacteria. Um, they can reproduce through transformation where those plasmids are exchanged, or you, you insert plasmid from a different source. Um, did we talk about insulin the other day and like how you can, well, let's say um, you are a diabetic and you are allergic to pig or cow insulin that um, normally would be given to you. Mason, you need some really good, like normal human insulin, okay? And if y'all haven't heard in the news, insulin's pretty expensive. Um, a lot of people who are diabetic have had trouble in the past few years getting it. So can we make human insulin if you, without just harvesting it from like somebody else's pancreas, like some weird science fiction? Yes, we can. So all you have to do, I'm, uh, I'll simplify this. Let's say, um, Mason, you've got either a genetic problem or your pancreas has got an autoimmune disease, but... Let's say Ashlyn over here volunteers one of her good insulin genes. Can you do that? Okay, thanks. So we're gonna take the insulin gene from Ashlyn. Really, it's all about the same in everybody. And we're gonna take that and make it into mRNA. Why can we just not take that gene, cut it out of um, Ashlyn and put it directly into Mason? DNA has endrons. Uh, excuse me, sorry. Why can we not take it out of Ashland and put it directly in the bacteria? Because the bacteria will make, they'll, they'll, they'll make a protein for us. Why can't we take it out of Ashland and cut it and paste it directly into um, a bacterium through the uh, CRISPR process? Why can't we do that? Because 
DNA has introns. Very good. So DNA has introns and eukaryotes. So it has extra DNA that bacteria have no idea what to do with. It's like a language they wouldn't even know, I mean, where to start, okay? So how do you get the DNA into the bacteria without having introns in it and it still be DNA? We have to make it into mRNA. Okay, so you make it into mRNA, which we can do. Cut out all the introns, you've got a piece of mRNA, and then what can you do with it? Put it back in the DNA transcriptase. Okay, so you use reverse transcriptase to put it back in DNA form without any? Without any introns. Without any introns. And then, then you can cut and paste that into a bacterial plasmid and insert it in. Um, good. So, and that's essentially what we're gonna do in a couple weeks with the transformation lab. You guys are gonna have, it's that yellow box over there um, from BioRat. You guys are gonna have some bacteria that you grow in a Petri dish. I'll take you through this online. Um, and there's a, a vial with this plasmid that has a plasmid and one of the genes in it is a gene for a jellyfish to glow in the dark. You're gonna take that plasmid and you're gonna coax the bacteria into taking that plasmid up. And then once it starts growing and making a colony, then all its little clones should also glow in the dark. Does that make sense? It's just you have to get it to take it up first. Okay. Um, what else are we missing here? Transduction is another means of DNA variation where viruses change it. And conjugation is, remember, the uh, whips where the bacteria use this pillar structure and they basically use a whip and they grab the other bacteria and then they exchange DNA through that. That's a, the equivalent of closest thing we can call it to bacterial sex there. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about before we stop here. Oh, yeah. Bacteria. Sorry, skip back to the last notes on restriction enzymes. This is fascinating stuff. That's why everybody's about to fall asleep in here. All right. How many of y'all have heard of CRISPR? Walker? Y'all need to get out more. What is CRISPR, Walker? CRISPR is basically like how people are like, it's basically just like trying to fix DNA by like splicing it and like trying to fix DNA and like, uh, it's hard to explain. Right, I'll give you the simple version because I'm pretty simple and this is all I know. Let's say you have cystic fibrosis, which is a genetic, a pretty common genetic disorder and you've got lung issues and you may not live past 40, which is about the average age. Everybody else in here has normal gene for it. Um, you do not. You got both those bad genes from mom and dad. So with CRISPR technology, they basically in the past few years, a couple groups of scientists figured this out about, I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago now, um, that you can take these restriction enzymes from bacteria, you can cut DNA, you, you can program them to cut DNA at a certain point. And so basically the idea would be like, you could take a good gene from Tay, cut it out of her DNA, use those same enzymes, cut your DNA and cut out the bad gene and insert her good one. And so it's just a way of hopefully in the future, now you guys may be older before they figure out how to actually apply this to humans because they've also got to get this transported into your cells. So a way to cut out your bad gene, take a good gene and splice it back in. So really any genetic disorder could be solved if, if they could figure out how to use this on a large scale throughout the whole body. Um, it's not like you can just target like, you know, a s small group of cells in most cases. You know, if you've got genetic damage, it's throughout your body and you've got to, you've got to, at least you would have to target your whole lungs in the case of cystic fibrosis. So, um, that's how restriction enzymes are used in CRISPR. And one other thing I want to say about um, restriction enzymes. Bacteria use these enzymes to kill what? What's, what's the, why did they make them originally? I forgot, I skipped over this part, sorry. Bacteria make restriction enzymes to kill. What do bacteria not like? Bacteria Viruses, good. So you know how we have immunity, like when you get sick, like you, you get sick and then your body remembers it and you can fight it off the next time? Well, if you get sick, let's say you get sick with a flu walker and you develop this immunity and antibodies and stuff and memory cells, when you have kids, are they gonna be able to fight off the flu with that immunity that you had? No, you don't pass that on. You pass on the traits for the different immune cells, but you don't pass on that immunity. Bacteria is different. 
So bacteria, they can chop up viruses at a certain location. Like if a virus comes in, they chop it up, these restriction enzymes. They'll take a little piece of that, they'll tuck it away in their DNA, and so they remember it next time. And so when they start encounter that virus, they make some more of those restriction enzymes and chop up the next viruses. And then when they clone themselves, Matthew, what happens? Well, that DNA, that RNA that they've, or that viral DNA they've embedded in their genome is going to get copied and passed on to their offspring. So then their offspring are going to remember it. So it's really like a um, inherited immunity that they've figured out how to do and pass on. So it's a pretty cool um, way that bacteria are able to keep fighting and continue to improve upon that as they, as they go through different generations. Okay? Thanks for listening. <laughs>